Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Cavestro Arena at K2022. We now want to talk about circular design and specifically why material matters for product design. So we all know, yes, we want to go circular. We live in a challenging time. At the same time, these are exciting times because new material, new materials actually allow us to rethink the way we design products. And we are now very fortunate and privileged to have an internationally acclaimed authority on that topic specifically. He knows everything about materials, knows everything about their application in design. So please give him a big round of applause. Here he is, Chris Lefteri. Chris, so good to have you. Thank you, Martin. You will have the chance to ask him questions afterwards, but we'll start with learning a little bit from him. Uh, so the stage is yours. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I know everything about materials, so just uh, if you ask me some tricky questions, <laughs> I'm not that knowledgeable. Um, I want to start with something that um, maybe you've seen the posters for. This is 70 years of the K. And if I think about 1952 and what the world looked like in 1952, when we had the first K edition, and it's a phenomenal achievement that an organization or an event to do with a material can be 70 years old. Um, I wonder what the world looked like. And if I think even more about a 30-year period between, let's say, 1940s and 1970s, the world must have been an incredibly different place from the 1940s to the 1970s. And I f almost feel like it would have been, like you see in black and white movies, monochrome. And through the introduction of plastic, or through the commercialization of plastics, changed completely. And I imagine that by the time we'd implemented these huge changes between the 50s and 60s and 70s of plastics, that actually the world was incredibly brightly colored because plastics allowed for this infinite change of shape or color and really, I believe the world would have been changed forever because of this material. But it is this, the way that it is the way that plastics look that has become its downfall because it is so visual and it is so apparent when we see problems that we see today because it is physical, it is there. But for a designer in the 1950s or 60s or 70s, it was an incredibly optimistic time because you had this new material that you could really do anything with. And we were excited as a design group, uh, sorry, as a design industry. We were optimistic, we were passionate. And if you think about now, the perception really of plastics, you might think is the opposite, it is the reverse. And that's the perception, but actually I think the reality is that we haven't seen a level of innovation or opportunity in this material since the 1950s or 60s. Because the plastics industry is going through an immense monumental shift, maybe not so visible, maybe it's not gonna change the way the world looked, but an incredible shift in the way that plastic is perceived, in the way that it is used, and how designers work with materials. But, and this is the, the title here, um, circularity in the Wild West. So the Wild West, I'm talking about, you know, cowboys and Indians and frontiers and the kind of chaos of exploring new territories. Because, yes, we want to do well, but circularity is such a complex thing. Environmental choices is such a complex thing that I can say from now in 2022 and the last K in 2019, there has been huge change in evolution. To give you an example, the language that we use today, I think, is different. When I started working on projects that were to do with the environment, we used the word bioplastic quite a lot. It was one of the first words that defined this era. But to me now, bioplastic is a very vague, very difficult, almost um, useless terminology because it doesn't mean anything. It, it can mean materials that come from nature or it can mean materials that degrade or they compost, but actually I'm not sure whether any of those two things are great. So the language of sustainability has evolved and it's a changing quickly and fast. I had a conversation with a client recently about 
trying to create effects, and I'll talk more about this in a second, um, but you see this sample here, this brown one with the little specks. This, this, I, this is a very on-trend effect of creating what looks like waste in the, in the plastic. And the conversation led to, well, how do we know that the, the material, in this case it was mica, is ethically sourced? And it, it just it, it becomes another question that you have to address, another thought, another insight with understanding whether something is good or bad. And this frontier that we keep pushing in terms of circularity or the environment or new materials is constantly changing and we're constantly finding out. And I'm having conversations with clients about whether this is good or that's good. Um, and we have to work our way through this. So I want to deal with three main areas. The first one is opportunities in plastics and CMF. So CMF represents color materials and finishes. Um, the reason that I'm showing this sample predominantly in the next few slides and the previous one is because my studio designed this and you can see a whole bunch of them over there. So it's a little promotion. Um, the purpose of the sample was to create something that was generic that could be used to uh, show effects or colors or textures and it allowed for a playfulness. There's two parts to it. There's the top part and there's the base. Now that interchangeability, particularly with um, transparent or translucent materials, allows the user, the designer, to play with different effects and overlaying colors and textures. So I talked about opportunities and how now is a huge opportunity as a designer to work with new materials, with particularly plastics, because there are challenges that are arising from using recycled materials. There are challenges to do with manufacturing, to do with sourcing, to do with quality, to do with storytelling and marketing and um, consumer experiences. But for me, these, these challenges are where the opportunity is. So for example, this um, speckled effect, which is if I were to draw uh, a parabola like this, and this is an emerging trend, this is a trend that's on peak, and this is a trend that's already gone, and this is declining, then speckles are kind of here. It's not at the top. It's almost at the top, but it is in everything. And I'm sure that within 60 seconds, I could find a pair of shoes with had some speckles in them. I'm sure that give me another, you know, two minutes and I find some products out there which have speckles on them. Because this is a story that makes it very accessible for consumer brands to um, communicate that they have an interest in being ethical. Now, we can talk about how speckles are created and they should be ideally made from waste that doesn't pollute the, the base resin uh, because if it pollutes it to a certain proportion, you can't recycle it. So we need to be thoughtful about this. Um, there are issues with that because if you use certain plastics with, let's say, polycarbonate or ABS, um, they don't create this defined speck, okay? And it's not easy to create these specks. So then we have to look to things like mica if we want to create the effect. But then some people might argue, well, how do you justify the use of a material that is not necessarily waste to create an effect? And then this becomes another discussion. But this is an opportunity for me. This is an opportunity to redefine how we can use, let's say, recycled polycarbonates or we can use polycarbonates that come from waste of oil uh, to be used in this, and understanding how they can be used to create these different effects. But we also have to think about um, how we control surface finish. And one of the things we have to be thoughtful about is how when you're combining, let's say, virgin with recycled material, that creates what you call, what you might perceive here is as a marble effect. And way, one way around this is to use a process, rapid heat cycle molding, which does reduce that to create a homogeneous, flat, beautiful, pristine surface. So we have to understand this. But the other thing that maybe is more of an opportunity, and if we think about this, this shape again, maybe this is still here. It's not at the top yet, but it's more here, is that as we use more speckles, as this becomes more and more valuable as a communication story, 
maybe the idea of a plastic being visible with its imperfections is going to become more acceptable. And I think this is something that some brands are maybe already exploring. I think Dyson is a very good example of showing flow lines in its metallized plastic parts and turning that into a positive story about liquid metal, I think it is. But maybe we can use this imperfection as a way to generate a story about sustainability and make it something that is valuable and aspirational rather than something that is in perceived as being imperfect. Um, we can also use that particular rapid heat cycle molding technique to create holographic effects. So by having very, very fine textures in the tool at an almost microscopic level, allowing that to create holographic effects. I'm sure there are some examples on the Covestro booth that illustrate that. So we can combine that with a way. Um, so I've talked about aesthetics. And aesthetics are very important because it's, it's about storytelling. And it's about understanding the problems, but also the opportunities with these types of materials. Um, some of the other strategies is what I've kind of referred to as doing more with less. So there are, this is an example of a headlamp that um, uh, is Corvestro has been responsible for, which is about reducing the number of materials in the headlamp to a single material to using polycarbonate, which allows for um, ease of recycling. Um, you can look around at other booths and you'll see some examples of shoes that also have this mono material theme. And again, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to understand the materials that you're working with as a designer enough that you can then take the properties and allow them to work for you rather than against you. Um, the next opportunity is to consider end of life. So there is um, an exhibitor in one of the halls here, um, which is based on stripping laminated materials, laminated plastics, down to their essential components. So we kind of move away from materials that um, are composites because they're difficult to recycle, but you know, ideally, we want to think of this monomaterial theme. But at the same time, we also have to think about different opportunities that are to do with composites, because there are ways that composites really are irreplaceable. This is um, some packaging that is using only, uh, or is using the, the natural adhesion of the material to create the glue. There's no secondary material. So the whole thing can be easily recycled. The next opportunity is giving more than you take. Um, again, there are, there are uh, products in this, in this hall in particular where carbon has been extracted to, from the manufacturing process to create products. Um, this is an example of some ink that, uh, again, has taken uh, the carbon from the manufacturing industry and turned that into an ink. So it's the idea that you can not just add, but also take away, if you like, um, is something else that uh, I think is important for designers. And the next thing is understanding your materials. There are certain rules that we follow when we're designing with materials. And the first rule is that you have to understand the value of a material. And the value of material can be broken down into three things. It can be broken down into its function, how it performs, it can be broken down into um, its aesthetics or sensory, so what it looks like, what it feels like, does it have a smell? And then the third thing is understanding how it makes the user feel. And this is really important, and I think as a designer walking around these halls, this is what I think about. How do you break down what it is that you see, not just in terms of performance, but how it can make somebody feel? And the best way to sensibly apply materials is to have a deep knowledge of that, of the materials. And this is a project um, that was a student project to look at three different scenarios for an umbrella and how the value of those materials can be used to create um, three different sustainable stories. 
So you have on the right hand side a mono material story. So mono material products are where the product is made from a singular material, so it doesn't have any issue with recycling. Um, so that's made from polypropylene, from the fibers to the the sticks, the handle. Um, the one in the middle is using machined parts, so machined aluminium, so that we're removing the manufacturing of molded parts and we're dealing with um, uh, materials that can be um, easily taken apart and recycled. Then the third story here is a luxury story, because in the luxury story, you never want to throw this umbrella away. You keep it for as long as you, as, as long as you want, basically. Um, so you have three different approaches to sustainability, and that's about understanding the value of materials. It's about understanding this one because I never want to throw this away. I feel completely attached to this product. Um, this one may be on the other end of that extreme is something that we can pick up and maybe we can recycle very easily and there's a very low emotional attachment. So understanding the materials and understanding how they can play to those emotions I think is also really important. Um, but I want to finish with the, th uh, the final kind of recommendation, which is this, that I, I talked about 70 years ago at the beginning of this industry. And interestingly, this was 70 years ago, polycarbonate didn't, wasn't a commercial material. A company called Bayer developed it in 1953. If I'm right, that was my little research beforehand on Wikipedia, but you guys correct me if I'm wrong. But I talked about that opportunity, the opportunity and that excitement. And I think that sense of emotion is really important to stick by because if we are pessimistic, if we are constantly telling stories that are to do with, um, that, that are not inspiring, I think it's, it's not going to be easy because I think as consumers, we are drawn to things that we want. I think that's what consumerism, consumerism is. You want something rather than you need something. And there was um, uh, a podcast that I listened to by somebody, a philosopher, who said that rather than painting materials from a negative perspective and sustainability as a chore, that actually we should think about sustainability as an opportunity. So rather than having solar panels on your roof and it being a problem and being expensive. His example was to say, solar panels on your roof means you can have a disco in every room. And I really like that. And I think this idea of waste and defining circular materials and building what is a very different type of quality that draws people into a story in a very positive way is where the future lies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Wow, that was wonderful, really inspiring. So I want to open it up to the audience now. This is your chance to ask questions. Also, of course, if you're joining us online now, you can submit your questions via the various channels. So do we have any questions from the audience? We'll have microphones, we'll come to you. Not yet. So let me, oh yes. I wanted to break the ice, but this fine lady will do. Thank you for the presentation. So um, I think you just mentioned the plastics enable shapes and colors. So I'm from the materi uh, materials engineering company. We're a compounder. So it actually, in order to create colors, there are a lot of um, safety issues and dusts, not only doing the manufacturing, and also the problem comes with pigment and colorants. So it had it makes it a little bit difficult to, for example, they are sometimes they're inorganics, they're not the same as plastics when it comes to recyclable and the, all the other type of a aspects. It can be a problem. So I wonder, from your perspective, um, do you have any suggestions how we can be more responsible in using colors from your design perspective? Uh, that's a great question. But I think my, my answer would be to refer back to what I said about the Wild West, because I, th I think, firstly, the rules have changed from three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Our understanding, our level of sophisticated kind of questions that we ask are becoming much more um, complex. And I think if, I, if I'm asking, answering that question, let's say, for um, 
a consumer brand. I don't know exactly about your business, but let's talk about a consumer brand. I would say that the brand has to take a position and it has to say, our belief is that we need to remove all toxicity from our materials. Or, and that's, that is our primary goal because we believe that that is um, how we're going to reach a solution. Or you say, well, actually, we want to have all of our products um, you know, compostable in the ocean because that's you know, our approach. And I, and I don't think there's a right or wrong way. And I, I think companies have just to, 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 to be very clear and say, this is our approach. I, you know, we only want to use um, plastics that can be recycled. And if we, they can't be recycled, we don't want to know. So I think that's, that's it's, it's defining what it is that your particular goal is, because you can have sustainability goals, but uh, and a lot of corporations do. But in terms of actually how that how materials and products fit within those sustainability goals, I think is not so clearly defined. And some of the companies I work with don't know, and I think that's the first thing is to say what's our uh, focus. All right. Any other questions? So what I found very interesting was something that you said in the beginning when you talked about the imperfections. And my question is really, you know, isn't this also sort of representing our times that, you know, we are moving away from this perfectionist approach? We want individuality because we have so much, so many mass produce products out there. They're all the same, you know, whether it's smartphones, computers, or even cars, that, you know, we actually embrace this diversity, this, this imperfection, yes. this approach, to make it individual, you know? Yes. So isn't this also maybe something that, as a trend, is coming from society? Yeah, and I think it, it's, it's changing the way that, that we, what we expect from plastics, because, you know, when plastics came about, it was part, one of the things that made it so fantastic and incredible was that I could throw stuff away. It's like, oh, I could have my picnic and just throw it in the trash when I finished. And that's what we've grown up with. That's, that's our culture of plastic. We have to change that culture. And part of that change is to say, you know what? We can make beautiful things that are not perfect. I, I mean, you got back to the running shoes. I mean, th there are shoes that which have the, you know, the pigment, uh, sorry, not the pigment, the flake, flakes inside from waste, mm -hmm. that you can like, literally, literally pick it out, which probably 10 years ago would have been like, absolutely not. You know, we can't have customers mm -hmm. pulling out bits of plastic from mm -hmm. their shoe because it falls out. And it is changing the culture and the expectation, um, but not in a way that makes you like, oh, you know, please accept this imperfection. It's to celebrate the imperfection. Mm -hmm. And it's to celebrate the fact that um, not everything is, needs to be the same. And, and for me, it's fascinating, this contradiction that we live with, because on one hand, we live with this story that is an aspirational story of premium, because it's to do with handmade craft, and each one is different. And at the same time, we want pro plastic products to be exactly the same. Uh -huh. It's like, no, just tell the story for this material. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny, because I have shoes like these. They're made from plastic bottles. And they're, you know, like every pair is different. So when my kids saw them when I got them, they thought, Wow, that's so cool. Why do they look like this? I explained they're made from, you know, recycled plastic bottles. And then they question, it's like, why are our Lego bricks all the same? <laughs> why like when they build a house from red Lego bricks, it's just plain red. It's boring. Mm. So they would actually embrace Lego bricks, you know, with spackles. Yes. So they'd have an individual surface. Exactly. You know, I, I don't know what Lego's doing at the moment, but I'm sure they, they're, they're doing something mm. they have to do. So it's interesting to me to see when we talk about circular design and we talk about advanced materials, yes, that you know, also outside influences like society, trends that come from society influencing possibly you as designers, but also you know, companies like Covestro rethinking materials. So do, do you think it's like a bi-directional thing that you as designers get influenced by you know, what's actually possible yes. today in technology, but also you know, maybe what would be, I don't want to say sensible, but you know, what we're good to do uh, in terms of yes. product design? It's a, it's a two-way thing, but you, you know, we're, we're standing outside Covestro, which has this beautiful, always has a beautiful booth, uh, and always the samples are very much, you know, what as a designer I'd want to see. Aesthetically because pleasing. Because it's te it's, it, but it's physical. I mean, there are a number of, I, I, you know, uh, booths here that, of companies that produce plastics, and it's like, I can't see anything 
show me some plastic, show me a part. And, but you know, here it's, so here we have this advantage. And, and it's very much a two-way uh, experience mm -hmm. you know, with what Covestro does and as a designer. But it's about, uh, it, it, with those companies that you don't have that, you have to almost kind of draw out this, what does this material do? How can I use it? What is it how can I color it? What happens to it at the end of life? And then you have to start to you know, really exploit its advantages because you ha and you have to work very hard as, as a designer to do that. Mm -hmm. But and, and so the trends, uh, you know, Corvestro presents trends as a designer. We recognize those trends. We kind of reflect those trends back, and it's a two-way thing. From most material companies, you have to uh, very uh, expressly communicate this is where we want this trend to go. And as I said, this this shape is very important. Mm -hmm. Because some brands, they're, you know, they only want to be here. They don't want to be the leaders. Other brands who want to be at the peak, you know, or, or, or the emerging brands, I should say, um, shoe brands, I think, are very good, or fashion accessories, because they can be very adventurous. Um, whereas, you know, appliance companies, big companies, you know, I won't mention names, but maybe refrigerators, they're not going to be adventurous. They're not going to push those trends. So you have to understand the, the nature of how trends work and where they start and where they end up. Really fascinating. So, do we have any other questions? Yes, we do have a question. It's wonderful. Hi. <laughs> um, Chris, I have a question, which is, um, you said the language also changes. And, and how does it actually change? Because to me, it always, it, it feels a bit like we've made it cheap. We, we talk about plastic and cheap and lots of it, and, and some of the applications are not really attractive either. When it started, it was called Kunststoff. And it sounds so much more um, valuable. Mm. And maybe we should go back to the roots and make it more valuable again, because yes. it, is, it is a Kunststoff. Sure. And, and it, uh, there was something very interesting that I found out, that one of the early polymers, which was celluloid, was, was developed because you know, people paying billiards. Um, the, the balls were made from... Um, uh, rhinoceros horns, right? Which is not great. You kill the rhinoceros to make the billiard ball. And so these guys developed celluloid because celluloid was like, you don't have to kill a rhinoceros anymore. We've made this cool material. But, and it had a value. And, and the value was very clear in the sense that, you know, it had to be perfectly round, had to be shiny, it had to make the right sound when you were playing billiards. And so the value was there. It's just that we, we, we exploited... And, and I think that... I think that it's not that we're bad. You know, the, the, we were brought up on this premise that plastic is also disposable, but we just have to change that um, that expectation. And, and the quality level can come from what it looks like or what it feels like, but also it can come from a story because I'm much more like, I think consumers are much more likely to buy um, um, any any component, if you tell them that, oh, this material used to be, you know, cooking oil made to make meatballs by Ikea, I don't know. You know. Um, and, and that value comes from the story as well as just the, um, and the language, I think, is uh, part of that. And we do have a question that just came in uh, over YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if that is the perfect question f for you, not being, you know, with Covestro, not like being an, uh, uh, a materials specialist per se in, in the technical aspects. The question is, how could polycarbonate uh, be used in 3D printing for the housing sector? When we speak about design, also, you know, when in you know the large scale, the buildings, also a lot changes um, in terms of material. We want to go, you know, away from concrete, a lot of CO2 emissions. So is there something that you can say, you know, something about? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. My answer to that question, because I, I don't know the answer, but my question is that's a great starting point. Uh -huh. <laughs> because, sure, how, how can polycarbonate be used in the housing sector? Why not? Start with that, yeah. yeah. See right. where it takes you. Maybe, yeah, we'll talk to some uh, the Covestro people. Maybe someone from Covestro can also give you an answer digitally. Um, maybe a better answer than we can supply. All right, do we have any more questions from the audience? Last chance to get your question in? Yes, one more. Um, so, like, circular plastic parts. Or it kind of sounded like it implies that they have speckled. So what comes after the speckled trend? What, oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the, the best question. question. <laughs> that is the best question. And that's the one I'm, I'm working on, the answer to. <laughs> I, I, I think that um, the, I, I showed this sample of the, the black piece, where on one side it looked like marble, on the other side it was very clear. 
Um, I, I think making the waste visible, but not, you know, because speckles, you could say, is one natural effect. But what's, what's an, a more natural effect? And I think marble, I think, you know, why don't we take this problem that you see the flow and, and turn it into, into something that looks like marble or, or slate or something like this? Um, I think, but that's, that is a fantastic question. And <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know in six months' time when I've worked it out. Yeah, maybe we'll have you back in the next <laughs> K in three years, and then we'll talk about that. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your question. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come here. He will also be on our panel when we talk about the future, the visions uh, for new materials and circular design at 3 p.m. So don't miss that if you want to hear Chris again. All right. Thank you so much for now. Thanks.